do I believe in pants still or like what's the thing here? Do you specifically believe in dropping a bag on pants? Like I have spent years being like, okay, because you can wear like pants and shorts and jackets and shit like multiple times like between washes, but you can't with like a fucking shirt. I usually spend way more money on pants and shorts and jackets. Okay, we'll pause on this real quick. Yo, Look who it is. Up? What's up, guys? Kyle Craver. We're currently talking about the state of pants culture. Damn, what's going on in pants culture? Uh, Drew was just explaining, yeah. <laughs> That's it. Drew's an expert on, on pants culture, largely yeah. speaking. It is my belief that the amount of money that people are willing to spend on pants, shorts, and also jackets has decreased in proportion to the amount of people, amount of money that people are willing to spend on shirts and hats, given the post pandemic normalization of the Zoom meeting. Hmm. We talking dress shirts here or like graphic tees? Because I have noticed the price of graphic tees has been skyrocketing. Oh, it's got insane, man. It's, it's ridiculous. Okay. So the market does back me up on this. But I don't know if the price of pants has gone down. I think the price of pants is also high. I haven't seen one of those uh, Levi buy one, get one free sales in a long time. I'll say that much. Oh, no, hmm. dude. They're buy one, get one 50% off at this point. I, yeah. I recently bought some Levi's. And, <laughs> and... You buy some pants, you get some shorts. But to go back and answer your question, I think pants have kind of got more important. Okay. Because like pants, it's probably the coziest piece of any outfit. Like if your pants Mm -hmm. are uncomfortable, you're uncomfortable. A shirt being a little too tight, you could deal with it, you know? Not wearing the right socks, you'll get through it. Feet might be a little cold, but you'll get through it. If your pants are too tight or like they're too big and like the belt's not strong enough, if they're too thin, if they're too heavy, like it'll just fuck your whole thing up. (laughs) Fuck your whole thing up. You're like, why did I wear these heavy ass pants? What kind of shit are people putting on their legs in LA now? Big pants, I'm telling you. This is what kind tiny shirt, big ass tiny pants. Tiny shirt, yeah. big pants. Yeah, it's like the you know the Y2K look, like pants that have like big old like uh, footholes in them, or like carpenter pants with a lot of pockets and stuff, and that's why they're big. I think both. Yeah, they're like pants that look like they're sort of tactical gear for. I don't know, like being in the Matrix. Like if you had to whip out like a CD-ROM out of one of the pockets, uh, (laughs) you could definitely do that. I got plenty of room for my pagers in here. But they're like lightweight pants, I think. You know, it's not like, it's not carpenter pants sort of deal. Like imagine if you just took a whole bed sheet. It's like that kind of fabric, not like the comforter, you know? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's like getting pretty close to just kind of like straight nylon. Back to parachute pants is what I'm saying. That's great. I'm glad to be able to pull my all my fucking parachute pants out of my closet. <laughs> all right. Well, this is Nerzy, the number one TV show criticism podcast on the planet. I'm Slava P. I'm Troy. I'm Drew. And we are joined by guest, the writer, stand-up comedian, rapper entrepreneur star of the fx original series kyle uh kyle kramer hello thank you for having me on i honestly thought that you guys had already been recording this for like an hour and just were having me on for the like guest portion so i'm really happy i made it into the intro this is like really (laughs) i'm really flattered because this is an audio podcast, people can't see this, but Kyle is actually in a tree right now. <laughs> so, Kyle, you're in you're in Los Angeles. What's the mood like there? Because the end of the strike. You know, one of the best things about living in Los Angeles is that everybody who like lives outside of the city assumes that like everyone here is deeply connected to like show business. But then, like, when you leave your house, you're like, ah, the main business around here is, like, landscaping. 
You know, like, <laughs> I don't, I feel like I see, I interact with a lot more people who like aren't in that world than people who are in that world. So like, is that what drew you to nature, the landscaping? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was, like a lot of landscaping around here. This is the place for me. Isn't landscaping out there just like laying a bunch of rocks in someone's front yard? <laughs> no, dude, you have no idea. The landscaping here is relentless. The amount of planting that happens here, where this is one of my really annoying soapboxes, so feel free to cut me off <laughs> at any yeah, point. Yeah, <laughs> but on, <laughs> but uh, they're really into planting like ornamental plants here that are kind of like weeds, and then they grow really fast, which means they have to be cut down all the time. And so there's like, a huge industry of landscaping people who like cut stuff down and then run leaf blowers. There's just kind of constant weed whacker, leaf blower type maintenance going on like everywhere in LA. So, so they're like holding people's yards for ransom. Kind of, but I don't think it's like intentional, but like it kind of is of like, Oh yeah, well you gotta have somebody take care of your yard because like you got all these plants in it that like grow really fast and so you're going to need someone to cut them down but it's like if you just didn't have those plants in the first place then you know like you wouldn't probably need as much landscaping this is like a big simplification of a general gripe of mine but yeah people are obsessed with landscaping here because the thing is people got to southern california from like the east coast and they were like whoa like anything will grow here and then they were like (laughs) let's plant all these like tropical plants that you can't grow like anywhere else in the U S. And so they got really into all these tropical plants. They plant, they planted all kinds of stuff. A lot of people don't know this, but LA what Los Angeles County for like most of the 20th century was like the top producing agricultural County in the country. Anyway, this is pretty boring, but, uh, that's no, 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 no. <laughs> Do you guys have like a, a rare bug that comes around every two years that you have to be like on watch for? Because we have that in Canada where it'll just be like some kind of like, oh, the Japanese worm beetle. It'll fuck up your trees. So if you see it, call this number. Yo, why is it always Japanese too? Because we got the like, we got the lantern lanternflies or whatever in New York. Also, the murder hornets are from Japan. Yeah. It's because of that. You guys seen that documentary, Godzilla? <laughs> <laughs> Let's say I haven't. Tell me what happened in it. Oh, okay. So the girl from Stranger Things, her mom is a scientist and she's working on like getting all of the giants together from all over the world. And once the giants wake up, the world will be like utopic, I think. And Godzilla is one of the giants. Mothra is one of the giants. And then they have to battle each other. Is this the version of Godzilla that where like, p diddy collaborated with uh the guitar guy for some reason whose name is escaping me slash yeah close enough is that the one where p diddy jimmy page, rapped the with slash? Jimmy page. oh my god no this is the one with uh that's like it's almost like pacific rim they did it like pacific rim style but with the uh godzilla bad guys but anyway yeah bugs be fucking shit up japanese bugs specifically <laughs> And Japanese plants, man. My whole backyard's got, like, knotweed and bamboo in it. Oh, that Japanese knotweed is no joke, dude. Dude, fuck that shit. Yeah. Fuck that shit. The worst is uh, is actually... The, well, before I say this, let me preface this by saying there's a big debate in the invasive plant community over whether getting mad about invasive plants is xenophobic. To which I say it is not xenophobic. The fact that all the invasive plants happen to come from like China and Japan is just because those are like the farthest places on earth away from North America. And so their plants are the least related to ours, I think. It's really a critique of globalization, you're saying. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, the worst invasive plant is this one called Tree of Heaven that uh, is a Chinese tree. Ilanthus, Ilanthus something is uh, the Latin name. But yeah, man, that's where they all come from. Wasn't there like a big debate about whether or not mowing your lawn was uh, communist in the middle of the COVID pandemic? I remember because I got this New Yorker cover in the mail 
in jail and it had two different types of Americas on it. And one was like the straight laced, uh, crop haircut, King of the Hill style, clean front yard. And then the other one was like these bohemian Bernie Sanders hippie types. And they had, uh, an overgrown front yard. So was that not like a topic of discussion? Yeah, it's kind of become a topic of discussion because the leftist critique of the lawn would point <laughs> to the fact, which there is one, you may be surprised to find out there is a leftist critique of the lawn, but there is one uh, because it originated as a sort of demonstration of the English nobility of their wealth was the idea of having a lawn was like, oh, I have all this extra pasture land and I'm like so rich, I don't even need to like have my sheep graze out in it or I don't need to have it in like agricultural production. I just have like this nice trimmed grass that I can look at. And also lawns are really bad for the environment because people just like spray them with fertilizer and pesticides and they don't have as much like biodiversity. So, you know, a lot of the communist liberal type, you know, the brownstone dwellers of uh, that New Yorker cover are (laughs) like pro having lots of plants in your yard and not having like a manicured lawn. So as with everything else in society, this has become like a culture war thing of, you know, if you don't have a lawn, you're like hate America or something. Which I say, I don't have a lawn, and you can read into that what you will. <laughs> my neighbor's been, my, I have bamboo because my neighbor decided they wanted bamboo in their backyard. And so now, yeah, my neighbors are like right here. And then my, me and then the other neighbor on the other side, we all have bamboo in our yards now. So, But a bamboo outbreak is whimsical. That is true. Yeah. Bamboo, you're like, man, maybe a panda will just show up in here one day. It'll be adorable. <laughs> It's a Pixar movie. Yeah. My entire block has a morning glory problem because at some point someone decided to plant morning glories and they just started climbing the fences between all the yards. And because Emily and I did not like manicure our yard over the summer, the morning glories have taken up all but maybe two feet of our like six or eight foot wide yard. But they're pretty. Yeah, those are pretty nice, though. But I can see the dilemma. Yeah. No, they're beautiful. But also, like, I worry that they're going to, like, grow into the house and, like, destroy it or something. I don't know. I don't know shit about houses. I think there there is a manageable solution here, which is that you would cut them back. But I... Dude, I know a lot about houses, and it sounds like it's done for you. I'm sorry. It's, it's too late. My house is over. Yeah. <laughs> the, the morning over. glories are already in there. They're in the foundation now. They're going to grow and your house is slowly going to expand outwards. Uh, I mean, I'm not mad at that because it's like a row house. So if I can get like a few more inches on each side um, at the expense of our neighbors, like, you know, whatever. Yeah, you're set. Going back to the bamboo, I was just thinking about my I had a friend growing up who had this uh, like big patch of bamboo in their backyard. I know that I said earlier that it was like whimsical and that, you know, a panda might show up. But I actually remember specifically, we were all really scared to go in this patch of bamboo because there was like a rumor that there was like a rabid cat that lived in the bamboo. <laughs> And so we were like, yeah, you can't go in the bamboo. You might get bit by the rabid cat. Did somebody go in as a dare? Yeah. Some, well, like sometimes we'd be like playing soccer in the backyard and like someone would kick the soccer ball in there and then it'd be like, oh shit, like watch out. Like, <laughs> like what? Like the sandlot? We, we kind of, we came up with this whole like concept for like a, uh, do you guys remember that board game, Don't Wake Daddy? They would always have ads for it. Probably not in Canada. This is like, you know, too deep a cultural reference. Oh, it sounds weirdly familiar. Yeah, it was like a game where the whole thing was like, you don't want to wake daddy. And they would have these like ads where it would show kids like tiptoeing around the house. And then a dad in like an old timey like nightcap. And he would like wake up and everybody would be upset. 
But we were like, oh, they should have a game like that called, like, Don't Get Bit by the Rabbit Cat. And they <laughs> have ads for it where people are, like, going into the bamboo forest. And it's like, you know, the rabbit cat comes jumping out. and It would be terrifying. Was there, like, lore as to how the cat got rabid and also decided to live in the bamboo? No. <laughs> There was, I, there was just kind of it was like an unspoken thing of like yeah you know there's that rabid cat in there you know how in like hey arnold like gerald would always have a story for like everything like how stoop kid came to be uh-huh yeah it's like it, i feel like that wasn't a part of childhood i really experienced yeah we i mean there might have been an origin story for the cat but it might have happened on an episode before i showed up in the in, you know in the backyard or something um yeah it was just like a foregone conclusion of like there's a rabid cat in there and then after a couple of years we're like all right if that there is actually a rabid cat in there like i don't know it probably couldn't survive that long with <laughs> rabies <laughs> Like, we're probably safe but the you know the legend outlived it so so there's just like a dead cat that lives in the bamboo well yeah i guess yeah. lives is one way of putting it so what's going on with the board game is it still getting made did you talk to milton bradley about that or yeah the jingle is don't get bit by the rabbit cat don't get hey. bit by the rabbit cat hey i think jack harlow is available to record that yeah, you have to record that for us so we can use it as an intro to the episode. <laughs> Isn't that crazy that board games used to be a thing that like people did for fun? Board games used to be for kids, and now like they sell fucking twenty pound boxes full of shit for adults. Yeah, yeah, and now kids play just like something on an app. You know that? Have you guys ever played any of those games where it's like times X plus ten? You got to do the army thing. You got to go left. Yeah, right? I have. Uh, I got to like level two hundred, and then it kept freezing on me. Yeah, they're not very well built it's crazy how much money they spend on marketing yeah it's called like crowd evolution i download all those dumbass games i see on instagram they just eventually wear me down like yeah i got crowd evolution i got gardenscapes fucking what else well these are like all all those games that they just have ads for all the time that are like yeah and the people like who are playing it fucking suck and you're like i could do that yeah exactly. and that's what makes you download it because you're just so pissed off at the incompetence what try to like, prove ultimate, something wrong it doesn't exist ultimate disc 3d bubble pop crazy kick mr bullet um score hero rescue cut oh rescue cut actually has like some deep narrative structure to it it absolutely <laughs> does not <laughs> <laughs> How many of these do you have on your phone? This, I also downloaded a lot of these during the pandemic when I was slowly losing my mind. So Your phone is probably like 25% just games that you've played once. I was going to say 25% just spyware. Like You're like yeah. the top asset for every foreign government in the <laughs> United States. <laughs> They're like, this is great. This guy, he's just downloading everything you throw at him. Do whatever the fuck you want with my shit. I don't care. <laughs> what's the best? What's the best game on your phone? Uh, so I've just downloaded the fucking Final Fantasy VII Eternal Crisis. Oh, that's a that's a good game. Yeah, that yeah. Is. So like, they got they got uh the entire like Final Fantasy VII like suite or whatever on there. So they have like Crisis Core and shit, and the OG right. Final Fantasy VII. I'm downloading this right now so I don't forget. It takes up so much space, but it's worth it. And it's like the updated graphics, how they did the uh, Final Fantasy VII remake. Right yes. Here, it's those updated graphics, and it's fucking sick. I'm so in. I'm ready to... The battle system's so good. It's free to download, and then it costs money to do almost anything else in the game, but yeah. Is it one of those, like... I think they're called like gotcha games where you have to keep paying for new characters or nah, it's a, it's basically final fantasy seven, except um, you can get like upgrade bonuses and shit. Like if you don't feel like leveling up your material, whatever, you could just pay to level it up and shit kind of stuff. Oh, so they make it slightly too hard to level up normally. So you have to pay for it. It's like, from what I can tell, um, I've haven't been on it too much. I just made it to Seventh Heaven when Cloud reunites with Tifa again. Mm -hmm. So that's as far as I am in it. But it's been like pretty standard playable so far. It's actually a little easier than I remember Final Fantasy VII being. Maybe because I was like seven when the original came out. But yeah, <laughs> now I actually know strategy. I'm not just like hit an attack every fucking move. Like I know when to use my magic and when not to. Yeah, you can't just unload it on like one of the random like randomly generated enemies you got to save it for the boss 
Um, yeah, I do both, and I'm just fine out here. <laughs> Remember how I told oh. you guys that like Madden was really popular as like a PlayStation game in jail? Mm-hmm. The other one that was really popular was also Final Fantasy, but they didn't let you have memory cards, so you couldn't oh, that's turn. Cool. That's tough. Yeah, you oh, can turn tough. the system off. <laughs> yeah, so was there just a constantly running PlayStation? Yeah, and then if a guard decided to be a dick and would like turn it off, you just have to start from scratch. Oh, <laughs> oh, man. oh man. man, brutal! Imagine you imagine you make it to like as far as like when Sid finally makes it to space, and the guard's like, <laughs> nope. Yeah. But you have your whole life to get there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Or, like, imagine someone fucking, like, they're like, yo, let me play, let me play. And then, like, they get you killed. Like, <laughs> you have nothing to, you have nothing to load to. Yeah, because you can't even use the save uh, points. Like, Yeah, you're playing it on ultra, ultra hard mode. <laughs> Damn, that's great. Did anyone ever beat it? Uh, yeah, for sure. No, guys were, like, obsessed. And guys write things out right to like pass on to other people like uh star fox you know how there's like special ways you have to go to unlock certain levels Mm -hmm. someone had written out what you have to do to like get to every level and they would like pass that around it was like so they're like prison strategy guides yeah exactly (laughs) that's That's so so sick sick. wait i feel like this is where the whole like speed run industry kind of came from you know it's like (laughs) from canadian prison (laughs) gotta do a speed run of final (laughs) fantasy like what are we gonna do? Gotta finish before uh, like the dinner. You know. I mean, it is funny because uh, you get your hands on something and you're like, "Man, this is gonna do my time." And then you play for like two hours. You're like, "I'm fucking bored of this." Uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> we go do something else. I'm sick of playing Mario. I got to the water level and I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I never beat Super Mario Brothers on Game Boy because it was the same thing. You couldn't save. So, you know, it'd take like eight hours to get to the end of the game. It was crazy. Or at least that's how it felt because I was like seven. So maybe it wasn't that hard, but it felt hard. Was there ever like at your schools growing up, was there ever like sort of a social hierarchy uh, specifically for like the field trip bus? based on who had like a game boy or like the sega version of that whatever the fuck it was called or like even like a bootleg ass thing what's that sega genesis no game gear wasn't it was that something like yeah it was game gear the only good game on it was sonic that's fine that's all you need it was it was it was game boys for us but because like at one point in middle school there were so many different types of game boys it was mm. like, because it was like, you know, you had the big clunky one. Okay, you, you know, goddamn Don Dada the bus. <laughs> and, uh, but then when like the Game Boy Minis came out and they were a lot sleeker and cooler looking. Yeah. And you could also match the color to which version of Pokemon you got eventually. Then it was like, oh, okay. It's a new big dick in town. <laughs> <laughs> and then when the Game Boy Color came out, ooh wee. Yeah. Oh, we like, yeah, if you especially had the clear purple one, sh- yeah, you were out here. Yeah. I remember, I remember the clear purple one very vividly. The advance yeah. or the like Game Boy still, like the the one that goes up and down or one goes side to side, up and down, up and Game down. Boy, not the switch, yeah, they, no, the advance. Do you remember the advance? Yeah, it was almost like a stretched out hexagon. Oh, Game Boy Advance, yeah, oh, I remember that now. That was like real hard for me. I love that one because it had the itty bitty games. The games were like a little oh, rectangle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I played that the shit out of some Golden finish. Sun. Yeah, I had Tony Hawk's Pro Skater on that. I was crushing. Another it. big jail game. Yeah, yeah. PS One killed it. That Goldfinger song, dude. Tony Hawk came out and performed <laughs> it with the band recently. What? Uh, yeah, I saw. It. I follow Tony Hawk on Instagram because obviously coolest guy yeah like a year ago they the band brought him out to perform that song probably because i mean i don't think the band goldfinger has i don't want to anger the goldfinger fan community here but 
I don't know any other Goldfinger songs, but yeah, that's their big one. And uh, so, and they owe it all to Tony Hawk. So they brought him out on stage to perform with them. God damn. Did he like rhythmically do 900s while they played it or something? No, he sang the song. He didn't skateboard at all. It was what? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I'm not going to pay money to see Tony Hawk sing. Uh, that's like when Steph Curry came out and sang with Paramore. Like, I'm not going to pay money for that. I don't think Steph Curry's lived the kind of life where he could truly relate to a Paramore song. <laughs> I mean, he like grew up affluent and probably has had feelings while in high school. Like, no, that's fine. I feel like he was kind of, he was definitely a jock the whole time though. And not to say mm. jock don't have feelings, but like yeah, he was definitely listening to like jock jams and stuff, and like. Music. <laughs> you think that's what jocks actually listen to? They're like in the locker room. That's why they like, call them jock jams. They're like <laughs> the cellophane off of the new CD. They're like, guys, new jock jams just dropped. We gotta listen to this to get pumped up for the big game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come on, man. come on, man. Volume six. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, what, what songs were on Jack Jams? Hold on. Dude, you know what was on there was uh, Whoop, There It Is, Let Me See That Tootsie Roll. This was all on the like original Jack Jams. I remember because some, one of my cousins had this at like Christmas one year, and we were just riding around in my grandfather's car like all Christmas listening to like Whoop, There It Is. Yeah, what's, what's track list? Is great. Oh, oh, it, uh, is that one of the songs? Nah, okay, so let's see. Michael Buffer saying, let's get ready to rumble. That starts it off. Get ready hey. for this. Whoop, there it is. Strike it up. Tootsie roll by the 69 boys. Which I, always, <laughs> I always forget that was a group. <laughs> Pump it up. Come, baby, come. It takes two. Gridiron groove, whatever the fuck that is. Um, yeah, gonna make you sweat. Hip hop hooray. Pump up the volume. The power. Unbelievable YMCA. Oh, YMCA. <laughs> Pump up the jam. Uh, Twilight Zone, the old ball game, and then uh, extremely unfortunately, uh, Rock and Roll Part Two by Gary Glitter. Oh, nobody really knew about it to be fair at the time, but that's still like you know that choice did not age well. I feel like I've only heard about the Gary Glitter thing after they play the song somewhere. And then someone's like, oh, did you know Gary Glitter? Blah, 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 blah. But I don't, what's the Gary Glitter thing? I don't know about the Gary Glitter. Uh, thing. We're not going to talk about it on this podcast. All you need to know is that this podcast is anti Gary Glitter. Okay. You can Google it. Yeah, oh. he's up there with genocide. <laughs> <laughs> How uh, how has AI impacted the forestry business? Uh, I don't think at all. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let, I would like to say let's get to how Kyle ended up in the uh, the nature business because Kyle was a colleague. Kyle hit the hardest pivot I've ever seen in media, and yeah, it looks to be one of the best decisions anyone's made considering the state of media in twenty twenty three. I mean, yeah, I don't think anyone here is currently employed in a media job anymore. So I guess in a way we've all pivoted, so <laughs> voluntarily or not, but. I would have got there. <laughs> I, I would describe Slava's pivot as semi-voluntary. I, <laughs> I, made, some, I made some choices, that's right. Yeah, you were you were already embarking on a new career. It just was <laughs> I was freelancing yeah, heavily, yeah. Uh, freelancing. Yeah, and that's just it. Like we could all come back to media. We could all start TikTok accounts. Slava was also technically in the plant business, but <laughs> <laughs> uh you know what the most invasive species is? <laughs> the cops. I was going to say cocaine, but yeah. Oh, well. Penetrated every ecosystem. Um, yeah, I'll talk about my, my pivot from media. Um, I, yeah, I, 
I worked at media. <laughs> I don't, do you guys do you guys refer to a certain music website that this podcast may or may not be named after very often on a uh, yeah, podcast? We try to call it that place we used to work at. Yeah, like it's fucking Voldemort, but yeah, you can be Harry Potter. Yeah, so anyway, I worked I worked there. Um, and then I, yeah, I don't know. I really wanted to fulfill my dream as a young person of going and working in the mountains and being on like a wilderness trail crew. So I did that and I moved out to Colorado and I worked, uh, for the forest service for a couple of years. Then I moved to California and kind of did the same thing, uh, for this, city in northern or northern la county called santa clarita which is where like all the cops live from la it's kind of a terrible place but shout out to santa clarita because two weeks into working at that job covid hit and they just paid me to stay on the payroll for like uh, a month and a half and not do any work and then i had a job to come back to after they stopped paying me to not come in. Um, so I did, Wow. yeah, did some landscaping. As I mentioned, you know, most of my contacts in LA more skew more landscaping than, than writer's guild. Then I did some invasive plant removal, which is why, you know, I have a lot of facts to drop on that. Slava's like ready, ready to drop some knowledge darts on invasive plants right now. I can already see it. <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, then I was like, man, I'm never going to get a job where I'm not just doing manual labor for a low salary. If I keep doing these kinds of jobs, I need a degree that's kind of relevant. So I went to grad school and got a degree in urban planning, which is like, doesn't sound relevant, <laughs> but is basically like with the idea of that's kind of a relevant degree for working with all the different land management agencies and like challenges that come from, you know, trying to coordinate between all these different agencies that manage land. So that's that's my story. That's my pivot away from media. One thing I want to talk about is uh the last great project you embarked on before leaving uh, the place we all used to work. And that was the year of Lil Wayne. Never forget. You know, it's funny. I was actually reading a bunch of your Lil Wayne posts today. So I, as I would not have probably had much to say about it before, but I'm, I'm really fresh on the topic. Cause I, I was clearing out my in, email inbox and I found a bunch of pictures that I had emailed myself from an article about the nerdiest t-shirts that I saw at Moogfest in 2016. And I was like, I can probably, <laughs> probably let go of these photos at this point. But then I was like, I wonder what that article, like if it's still up. And then I Googled it and then went down the rabbit hole of reading some of my old writing. I was like, I used to be a pretty good writer. Now, now my writing is a lot more boring because it's like, this is why like, we need to justify the installation of bike lanes for this new grant proposal that we're working on. It's like a lot, a lot less colorful than quoting Lil, Lil Wayne lyrics. Well, you could always call them motherfucking bike lanes. <laughs> That's true. I could. Although, yeah, there's not like that many Lil Wayne lyrics about riding bikes. It's pretty much all about cars. Zoom on a Yamaha, chromed out 1100. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's a bike. A motorbike. Can a Yamaha go in a bike lane? This is an actual important urban. Well, we do fucking in New York. I'll tell you that goddamn much, and it pisses me <laughs> off. <laughs> you know what's big in Philly is like those Polaris slingshots. Oh, I hate those things. They're so cool. What is that one of those e bikes or some shit? No, it's like almost a car, but it's got three wheels and it... Oh fuck that. And it's a convertible. <laughs> yeah. Dude, it's so annoying because in LA it's like there's must there's some company that like rents them out to tourists. And so you just mm. see people like riding around in those. But I kind of feel like the joke's on them because they're just it's a lot of smog that they're breathing in, you know. I'm like couldn't pay me to have a convertible in this in this air basin. 
Are you talking about like the T Rex cars, like with that big ass tire in the back, and it's got the cage on it and shit? And there's always some guy blasting some like sexy ass eighties music out of it or whatever. I wish they were blasting some sexy ass eighties music out of it. No, it's always the most generic, like third generation Lil Uzi Vert knockoff music, and you're like, man, these people, they gotta go back to whatever Miami they came from. Like, <laughs> Well, in Philly, it's like people who have genuinely good taste in music, like they'll be blasting Project Pat while like driving around this one block near my house in a circle. I don't know. There's also this guy in my neighborhood who has one who also owns like a really shitty taco truck. And there's like a uh, neighborhood news Instagram where like normally they're just like complaining about like regular kind of nimby anti-gentrification mashup tone but then whenever they like try it they'll be like yeah the latest gentrification thing is like they discriminated against this taco truck and then everybody in the comments is always like fuck that taco truck (laughs) (laughs) and that guy has that shitty ass slingshot that he parks out in the street all the time so yeah that's like my impression of uh of the slingshot user base i think that like in philly like there's such a huge dirt bike and four-wheeler culture that there are things that genuinely like cool people ride around in so i think that maybe the slingshot culture is like an extension of that and so maybe my perception of the slingshot is extremely warped but like slingshot is definitely on mine and emily's list of shit to buy if we ever got rich all right. How much I'll, is a slingshot? I'll, I'll let you have that fantasy. Thank you. That one for five grand, so I don't know, man. It seems obtainable. <laughs> yeah, it's like relatively affordable price is offset by its lack of practicality. Like generally having a top that is either permanent or retractable is a good feature in a car, as is having four wheels and a trunk. And the Polaris Slingshot has none of these things. Well, let me tell you, according to Google Shopping, that roof part you can buy as an add-on. Oh, my God. Oh. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> Sling lines, flip top, modular roof system for the Polaris Slingshot. Okay. And then right next to it is just a regular actual slingshot like the toy. <laughs> <laughs> Man, what's next? They're going to make you buy the freaking brake pedal separately or what? <laughs> Yo, Drew, you can turbocharge your slingshot. You can turbocharge your slingshot? Yeah, which feels wildly irresponsible considering this does not have a roof that, that, you know. (laughs) It has an optional roof, I have been told. I don't think it's an option. (laughs) When you go to a slingshot dealership, when you go to Polaris uh, showroom, yeah. (laughs) This looks to be a third. Yeah, hold on. Let's look at the roof. Okay. (laughs) Slingmods.com. Hey, at least it's a dot com. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, currently the price is cut from fifteen forty nine to thirteen twenty nine. So you're Ooh. saving two hundred twenty dollars. I love a deal. You could uh, pick between the square style or the round tubular style. Round tube. Round tube. Round tube. Everyone's pretty sick, dude. When I grew up in like the rural ass South, like a bunch of people had jeeps, including my cousin Jana, and when. It, she like bought her Jeep. The salesman was like, this is a really good deal because it has doors included. That is true. A lot of Jeeps don't have doors on them. Doors are considered a safety feature on Jeeps. What kind of lobbying did they have to do on Capitol Hill to get that shit? Okay. (laughs) None. You just take them for a fucking ride in a Jeep off road. And they're like, yeah, fuck doors. Yeah, this is sick. Well, all I'm saying is it's time to get into the third party Polaris add on business. <laughs> it seems like it's a limited market and, uh, you know, there's a lot of need out there. Maybe we could yeah. do some drop shipping around that, huh, Kyle? What do you think about that? Yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, there we go. Yo, those um, drop shipping businesses are the way to go, man. You basically spend like three to six grand and that's just like mailbox money. I feel like the last time I talked to Slava, maybe you were involved in some drop shipping, um, and I was writing an article about drop shipping. I, yeah, that was our last interaction. 
You were writing for Drew, I believe. I was writing yes. for Drew. Oh, how far we've come. We've come so far. <laughs> Neither one of us has a drop shipping. St- well, actually, I don't know. Maybe you're still drop shipping. I- <laughs> I'm definitely not drop shipping anything. <laughs> I think drop shipping kind of like it sort of petered out because I do remember this was one of like Trump's like big, uh, big issues that a lot of people weren't following, but was really big in the drop shipping community was Trump was like, basically there's sort of this like postage rate arbitrage that makes like uh drop shipping make a lot of sense because it's like very cheap to mail stuff from china to the u.s because the the u.s postal service ends up like covering a lot of the cost of it but the chinese shipper only pays whatever the chinese shipping fees are and so trump was like we're getting a bad deal we need to make it like more expensive for like China to mail to the U S. Um, <laughs> but I don't know if he ever, he ever managed to renegotiate the postal rates on that, but I know that it was like going to be an existential crisis in the drop shipping community because it was like, man, Fuck. like Trump I mean, renegotiates the postal rates. Like it's over for us. What? Like when COVID hit and all the Airbnb people were freaking out. <laughs> yeah. I think it would have been a similar crisis. It's weird, though, because dropshipping got big not off the strength of one particular app. Like, you still have to, like, use a bunch of apps to make it happen, you know? It took some level of ingenuity. It wasn't just, like, dancing in front of a camera, which is hard, too. Sounds like you're a little bitter about uh, some of the some of the newfound TikTok stars out there. It is just, it's crazy to like think about like, oh, why is this person famous? Like, uh, what was the big one? Olivia Rodrigo. It was like a really big deal. It's like, why is this person famous? Oh, people like her on TikTok. No, no, no. Uh, she made a song. Wasn't she on Disney Channel or something? Was she? This is easily very powerful. Mm. Do kids watch Disney shows? Yes, kids still watch Disney shows, man. Where do you think they got all their money from? Disney? Uh, I don't know. It was smart Investments? Bonds, Star Wars. Like Moana. Yeah, they got they got a whole TV, well not TV channel, but streaming service where you can only watch Disney shit. You know where Disney really got its money is its investment in the place we used to work at. That's true. They really cleaned up on that one. Smart money. Olivia Rodrigo was a Disney star on some show I've never heard of in my life, but it wasn't. I wasn't the demographic, so it's cool. Yeah. It's called Bizardvark. Get the fuck out of here. Bizardvark. Wait, Olivia Rodrigo got famous off of a show called Bizardvark? Yeah. And that, is this an Arthur thing? Frankie Wong and Paige Alvera are two teenage best friends who post funny songs and comedic videos on the internet. After hitting 10,000 subscribers, well, we should be so lucky. Um, after <laughs> 10,000 subscribers on their Bugle channel, Bizardvark, a Portman duo of the... We know it's a Portman duo of. Um, they are accepted... <laughs> into the Google studios where they make their videos while also having to share them with other buglers. I'm unclear on what it's a portmanteau of. Is it a, is it a bizarre aardvark or is it an aardvark who does business? <laughs> the second one, obviously. <laughs> because both are plausible. And either way, it, it could really change the direction of the show. So in one paragraph, they use this word buglers six times. Like, I'm supposed to know what the fuck that is. Yeah, that's a portmanteau of View and Google. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll be <laughs> I'm going to take your word for that, because I don't think I'll ever talk about this again in my life. So Just wait till next week, buddy. So, Kyle, to do a podcast-style transition, uh, let's get it. what kind of vehicles were you driving out in the damn woods of Colorado? Uh, actually, we had a Polaris ATV. It was a real piece of shit. Um, <laughs> yeah we had we had uh like two we had two hondas that were awesome the honda atvs are the best um if you're mm-hmm. in the market for an atv the polaris one absolute garbage um mm-hmm. and then we had like a suzuki one i think from like the 90s that was it was a little rocky, but uh, yeah, it was pretty good. So the ATV, that was cool. I, I got a lot of ATV riding experience. Um, I also, not to continue to clown on Polaris, but uh, <laughs> I'm just going to lay it on them. Uh, the other like really popular thing 
was becoming more popular while I was there was these like uh, what they call UTVs or side by sides, which are like they're basically like a cross between an ATV and a golf cart. They're like, okay, they look like golf carts, but they have like the like beefier wheels and stuff of an ATV, but they're oh, like yeah, yeah, yeah. too big to ride on a trail. But the whole thing, they like sell it as like, oh yeah, you can use this for like four wheeling, like, you know, you would on a Jeep and like off-roading, but like legally you're not really allowed to ride them anywhere except for like gravel roads. <laughs> So okay. there would be these people who all <laughs> had these like Polaris TVs and they'd be riding them out on the gravel roads that like I could drive my like Honda Fit on this road. You got this impression that they were like, man, I'm doing this like really cool, like badass off-roading thing. It was, <laughs> then you'd be like passing them in the Honda Fit and be like, this is so depressing for you. You really should get an ATV. <laughs> um, so yeah. Takeaway is Polaris is trash. Okay. So get a slingshot competitor is what you're saying. If Honda made one, I would trust it. So Yeah, it's called the Honda Fit. Yeah, the Honda Fit is the competitor vehicle. And as a proud yeah. Honda Fit driver, uh, yeah, I, I recommend it. It even comes with a roof. You don't even have to pay extra. <laughs> Oh, what okay. do you think about the uh, Kubota? You like a Kubota? Yeah, Kubota. They, you know, they make some good stuff. I haven't, I haven't like ridden one. I, I don't know if they do ATVs. I feel like they're more like heavy um, machinery, right? They do like, UTVs. We zipped around. That's how we collected uh, maple syrup during uh, the season in jail. I had like uh, field trips where I got to go work out in the community. And uh, we collected a bunch of sap. We rode around on UTVs in the forest. It was fun. I miss it. That's the most Canadian shit I have heard yeah, about. I was going to say, like, this is not where I thought the segue was going to go. Yeah, Canadian <laughs> like, jail. They're like, oh, you got to harvest maple syrup up here. We, we were talking about <laughs> Olivia Rodrigo to like, yeah, state-owned syrup. And <laughs> well, yeah, all right. That's the funny thing is they can't legally sell it because it was made by prison labor. And there was a whole thing about our like goats because uh, it's a long story, but um, maple syrup is really hard to make. It's 40 liters to one liter. What do you mean your goat? There was like goats <laughs> that we were going to milk and make uh, goat milk for baby formula. But then we realized that that would be undercutting the local baby formula manufacturer. So there was like a whole thing that happened in the house of commons that said that we weren't allowed to get baby goats on our farm because we would be undercutting local small business with our prison labor. That does seem, in this one instance, given everything I know about Canadian jail, this does seem to mainly be a thing where they were like, wouldn't it be nice to give these guys some baby goats to hang out with? And like they were sort of trying to justify it as like, oh, well, they can like make some fucking baby shit out of it or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. I mean, everything you do in prison is supposed to be for other government stuff. Like we made cubicles for government buildings. We made furniture for the army. You're telling me a guy named Justin Trudeau doesn't eat any goat cheese? Like it seems like there was a <laughs> built-in market there already. I don't, I don't know how they managed to block this one. No. I mean, he, yeah, he specifically came and he had, uh, he chose one prisoner out. He would like stand at the top of the wall and like point to one and be like, that one, make him bring me my cheese tonight. <laughs> <laughs> one thing we haven't talked about is how Kyle is uh, the great T. Wayne liberator. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? I must have missed this. Oh yeah. I think you were in prison during this. What happened? No, this, this was this was pre. Well, maybe I don't know. You don't know my life. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> this was year Lil Wayne involved, and like, yeah, that was what like 2018, 20, 19? 2016 to seventeen. So yeah. Oh yeah, that's like because we had we were living on Barrett Street. Yeah, I was actually at Drew's house though when the T Wayne thing happened. Oh my God, I remember this. I was okay, like, do you want to kind of back up and explain the context for all of this? Okay, well, astute followers of pop culture may remember back in like 2007, there was a rumored 
Well, there were a bunch of Lil Wayne and T-Pain collaborations. T-Pain, of course, was the the voice of auto-tune. And then Lil Wayne was like being more experimental and artistic with auto-tune. And the two of them like really got along and they made a bunch of songs together. You know, there was that one on the Carter 3. It's like Get Money or Got Money or something. Um, yeah, that's an anti-capitalist song because they like either rob a bank or like just gain entree into a bank safe and then just make it rain in the bank. Yeah, they do in the video. But anyway, so there was this whole rumor of like Lil Wayne and T-Pain were going to make an album together. And they were like, yeah, like we started recording all these songs for it. And like it was going to be a big deal. They were like the two biggest artists at the time. Well, I mean, they were both a big deal. I don't know if T-Pain was ever one of the biggest artists, but in a way. He was ubiquitous. Yeah. And then it just never happened. And then, yeah, like 10 years later... When I was doing the year of Lil Wayne, I was like writing about all these Lil Wayne. What was the year of Lil Wayne if people are, you know, Zoomers or whatever? Oh, yeah. The year of Lil Wayne was this thing where actually everybody makes an appearance in this story. Because when (laughs) Trey and I were living together, there was one like shortly after we moved in together. Oh, yeah. Also context for the podcast listeners. Trey and I lived together for a year. Before Kyle went on his great wilderness yeah you know, rebirth like right after we moved in I don't know, we were just like listening to Lil Wayne one night like standing out on Trey's balcony and uh I was just we were talking about it I was like man this guy has released so much music you could write a blog post about a little a Lil Wayne song every day for a year and like not even come close to running out of Lil Wayne songs and I was like oh man I'm gonna do it uh which <laughs> is I only slightly regret. Uh, (laughs) At one point, if you Google Lil Wayne, it was like LilWayne.com and then Noisy. (laughs) Now, if you Google Noisy, it doesn't even say Noisy is like a top five result, probably. It's just like... I mean, our goal is for if you ever Google Noisy, one day you end up getting this. That is a good goal. Did you mean Nersey? Instead yeah. of an autocorrect that is like, did you mean noisy without me in it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which anyway, so I blogged about Lil Wayne every day for like a year, uh, which also meant that while Trey and I were living together, I spent like every Saturday in our apartment just like listening to Lil Wayne and being like, fuck, I gotta like brainstorm some blog posts about this. You were like the Dunkin' Donuts guy. What is a Dunkin' Donuts? Are you talking about Ben Affleck? No, no, no. The like time to make the donuts guy. Well, I don't know this guy. He's the, there's one guy who makes all the donuts there. <laughs> there used to be this Dunkin' Donuts commercial <laughs> where there was like one guy who worked at the Dunkin' Donuts and like a rooster would crow and it would be like pre break of dawn and he'd be like, oh, time to make the donuts. And then, like, the next morning, this is, like, oh, an iconic... Okay, why is this, like, an old Italian man with the Hitler mustache? I don't know. I mean, who do you think lives in New England? Who do you think like, drinks Dunkin' Donuts? Yeah, who do you think Mr. Ice Spice Duncan is? Um, yeah, didn't Ice Spice do a, a drink with Dunkin' Donuts? Oh, so you do know stuff that happens online sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've been watching a lot of Undercover Boss lately, and that's like that commercial plays at least once every commercial break. Because he's the boss of Dunkin' Donuts, uh, the well, guy who like, makes all the donuts. Or it's like Ben Affleck is the boss of Dunkin' Donuts, and Ice Spice is the new upstart. And oh. and what happened to the like, guy who makes all the donuts? He's just out of the picture. Well, I just posted a link to whatever happened to the guy who, yeah, it's, it's, it's literally the name of it. We're, we're so off topic right now, but yeah, whatever happened to Duncan's time to make the donuts commercial guy. Oh my God, he got canceled. He got canceled? <laughs> That's a lie. Please don't sue us, Michael Vale. He's a labor hero right there. Yes. It popularized, this is, I, I don't know any of the rest of the context of this article about what happened to him but there's just a header that says it popularized revolutionary business practices 
aka <laughs> having one guy make all six million donuts for you revolutionized <laughs> the world of business. Okay, this is an insane paragraph. I was blogging about Lil Wayne for a year, and uh, previously at Noisy, we had had a T Pain advice column where we would send T-Pain questions and he would honestly give terrible advice. It was always, <laughs> always bad advice. And we'd have to edit it to like make it less problematic. Cause we're like, man, we can't get <laughs> like canceled off of like his advice column. Um, <laughs> but I guess through this, like T-Pain and I became like friendly with each other. Uh, and I may, he must have started following me on Twitter or something. So anyway, one time I like posted, a, I did a blog post. I forget which song it was about, but one of the T Pain and Lil Wayne songs. And I was like, man, such a bummer that we never got the the T Pain Lil Wayne collaboration that was like you know so rumored or whatever. And he DM'd me on Twitter and was like, oh man, great blog post. He's like, you know, I still have some of those songs like sitting around. I should release it. And I was like, yeah, you should. What? <laughs> and so then he did. He just like put it up on SoundCloud. It was like four songs, six songs, something like that. Um, it he also like- literally tweeted, I forgot about this shit, but at Kramer KP like reminded me. And so I put it out. Yeah. And so straight up, we got the credit for it. You're a little Wayne made T Wayne happen. And uh, the songs were pretty good. Couldn't tell you the name of any of them now, but uh, I remember listening to them and, and thinking they were good. So, yeah. that's. Uh, I remember listening to them, and it kind of felt like, I don't know, like looking at a friend's baby where it was like, damn, my friend made this happen. Even if this baby yes. is ugly as shit, uh, I still love it. Um. So my judgment was clouded. I mean, that's how I, I think that's how I felt as well. But uh, yeah. But like, oh man, I haven't made a baby. It's ugly as hell. But I love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was like, my child is disgusting. <laughs> I'm, I'm objectively unattractive. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's the story of T. Wayne. And yeah, I remember being in Drew's living room and like seeing it happen and i was like true you're not gonna believe this was that the same night that davis's new dog bit me in the face i think that was later on this was one of my other fun life experiences with drew we went over to visit (laughs) our our friend and uh actually i guess at that point you maybe you were living with him and yeah i was living with davis so this was that was definitely later and um Cause when the T Wayne thing happened, you were still living in that like lady's like back house. It was a garage. You can yeah. just say garage. That lady's garage. Um, that sounds disgusting. You were living in that lady's <laughs> back house. <laughs> yeah, that, that garage. Garage sounds like less seemly. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, we went. We were Drew's friend. Well, both of our friend, but Drew's roommate, I guess at that point had just gotten a new like shelter dog and um there was a pit bull and very sweet you know friendly (laughs) pit bull uh that jumped up and bit drew in the mouth um (laughs) and drew i also made that happen gave him wound yeah and drew had like a cousin who was in med school and no, no, no. She was a ER resident or at UNC. A resident. There you go. Yeah, she was in the hospital system locally. She was, yeah. And you called her up and we were like, should I go get stitches for this? And she was like, probably, but don't go to the ER because it'll take too long. Let me like text my doctor friend group and see what they think. First, she was like, don't go to the ER because you'll be there all night. Hold on. I'm going to come over. I'm just going to grab some shit. And then like 10 minutes later, she texts me and she's like, all right. So I was just up for 24 hours straight in the ER. I tried to get in my car and like, I felt like I was driving drunk, so I can't go over. So I'm texting my friends. 
Yeah, and then we we went over to this like other like friend of hers apartment and it felt like you know in like a movie when someone gets shot and they're like involved in organized crime and they're like well you can't go to the real (laughs) hospital like you gotta go get stitches from like this guy named the butcher who like (laughs) lives in this garage who also lives in a garage i guess um and so we we just like pulled up to this girl's apartment and she just gave Drew stitches in her bathroom. And honestly, we're like a fucking Tarantino movie. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it it felt uh it felt pretty pretty cool, I thought. Also, uh Davis's girlfriend who is now his wife is was and continues to be a nurse and she also like randomly had some anesthesia at her house and so like she drove to her house to get anesthesia for this off-duty er doctor to shoot into my face in her bathroom jesus you're like a russian gangster yeah it was it was pretty gangster it was not gangster i feel like i may have had to hold your (laughs) hand because of how much it still hurt it was not your finest moment but You know, but the process of being operated on more or less like an injured animal was pretty cool. (laughs) It definitely Uh, did not inspire a lot of confidence in the formal medical system because I was like, You're telling me you can just go over to someone's apartment and like bring them a six pack of beer and they'll do stitches for you, and yet we gotta like you know, pay thousands of dollars to do this at the ER. Like what a rip off. So Man, we, we should have had Bernie. Kyle in your sort of post media tale you did neglect to talk about the greatest thing that happened to you in your post media life which is that you received a gigantic novelty check oh yeah that that's true actually in my regular media life i received no giant checks but as a grad student i entered a student contest um and i won And I got to pose with the mayor of Palm Desert, California, um, known as the place that sometimes people stay in if they're going to Coachella. Um, (laughs) It's slightly closer than Palm Springs to Coachella and slightly more affordable than Indio. And uh, yeah, I got to pose with a giant check for $2,000 shaking the mayor of Palm Desert tan. So... (laughs) That is the coolest thing that has happened to me pre and post leaving media. Did you not get to keep the check? No, I, I, I kept the check. I both got the direct deposit that corresponded to the $2,000 and I have a copy of the like poster board check up in my attic right now. Okay, so it wasn't like in Happy Gilmore where he has to like take the giant novelty check to the bank. No, but you would be surprised how many people like sincerely asked me like, well, how do you deposit that? And I had to be like, the the giant check wasn't, it's not a real check. I definitely was not going to ask that. (laughs) (laughs) I think I asked you that when you told me about it. Well, I mean, you'd be surprised how many people. (laughs) You like fold it up, I guess. It makes sense. Slava is going to let it slide because I know they have a different banking system in Canada. So <laughs> you actually get extra points if you deposit a giant check. Well, you have to fax anything over three furloughs, you know? <laughs> it's a furlough. Now that it's... I'm thinking about it, Kyle might be one of the most legendary people or vice to never have his own show. I appreciate that. Because but... I, you know, T. Wayne Liberator... Giant check haver, hot dog, hot dog swimmer. <laughs> oh my god. You're, you're a glizzy gobbler? Yeah, 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 yo, this is the OG glizzy the gobbler. OG glizzy gobbling. <laughs> so set the scene. Uh this was like 
the Friday before I officially started full time. And I came in and it was just a mess in there. And I was like, what the <laughs> fuck happened in here? <laughs> so what the fuck happened in there, Kyle? Well, what the fuck happened was I'm going to talk some real media inside baseball for a minute. I don't know if anybody remembers when uh, BuzzFeed did this Facebook Live video where they put a bunch of rubber bands around a watermelon and then it exploded the watermelon. Mm -hmm. Like after that happened, everybody was like, we got to pivot to doing Facebook Lives. We need to do Facebook Lives like nonstop. And so every meeting we had would be like, what can we do on Facebook Live? And every noisy meeting, we always were like, we should throw a computer off of the roof of the vice office. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember this, Trey? We sometimes suggested other things to throw off the roof, but it always involved us getting on the roof and throwing shit off of it. Yeah, it would be like, oh, what if we threw a bunch of records off the roof? And everyone was like, but that'll take like one second. The whole point of the Facebook Live <laughs> is that it's supposed to take like hours. We're like, yeah, you know what I mean? we'll, we'll, throw, we'll throw three computers off. Yeah, the roof. we'll build up to throwing the computer off the roof. We're not just going to start the video and chuck it. You know, we'll just commentary. <laughs> and then people will be like, well, what's the connection to music? And we'd be like, ah, uh, well, you know, you put your music on the computer and then you throw it off. <laughs> It's like, have you ever heard a Death Grip song? Like, that's exactly what that <laughs> You're off a fucking roof, dude. Yeah. So we were really, we were still trying to get this computer thing off the roof. And uh, <laughs> and Munchies was like, they got a donation of hot dogs from Nathan's Hot Dogs to do like hot dog eating. <laughs> this a like, donation. <laughs> yeah, it was like a Spawn Con. I don't know. It was, you know, leading up to the Nathan's Hot Dog eating competition or maybe it was after it but they had all these hot dogs, hot dogs. wasn't it like memorial day related or something like that i think it was after i think it was after the july 4th one because um well i'll get to that yeah because i started that june and okay well maybe it was right before they were trying to promote the july 4th one either way so they have this big <laughs> this hot dog eating competition on facebook live and like the whole office comes in there, like it's like a huge deal. They're like, wait, hold on. Can you also say who trained one of the people you were competing against? Oh, well, incidentally, a couple of years before, Drew and I were in the office one time, and one of our other co workers, River. Shout, shout out to River. Shout out like, to River. He's, he's like the true spiritual friend of the podcast, true vice legend, uh, was interviewing Kobayashi. One of the all-time great glizzy goslings. One of the all-time <laughs> greats in the in the glizzy gobbling, um, and so if there ever was one. And so Drew and I, that was like you know there were a lot of celebrities at Vice Office, but that was one of the few <laughs> times where I feel like we were really starstruck. We were like, "Whoa, we got to yes. meet Kobayashi!" So we went in there and we met Kobayashi. And I remember asking him right there. I was like, "Well, how do you do it?" And he's like, "Oh, you got to dunk the buns in the water." You know, you think that's incidental knowledge, but <laughs> two years later, <laughs> who should find themselves in a hot dieting competition? But yours truly. But River was I think River was also there competing. But I think River, River was like trained by Kobayashi or something. Yeah, I think he might have done a whole stunt journalism thing with Kobayashi. Yeah, where he trained with him, and so you know there was a lot of competition. Everybody's packed into the main room there. Trevor, our boss at the time, was like, I'll give you 500 bucks if you win the hot dog eating competition. <laughs> I like how all the publishers are definitely like doing side bets. Like, <laughs> My pony's going to win the derby. Like, yeah. I, to this day, I'm like, man, that's like the best bonus I ever got in <laughs> working with. Um, because, spoiler alert, I won the hot dog eating contest. It was sudden death. It was sudden five, death. yeah. It was five minutes. Eat as many hot dogs as you could, and I ate ten. And then also Tyler and I tied. So then they were like, "We're gonna have a one minute sudden death face off." And you know, if you're keeping track of ten hot dogs in five minutes, the pace of eating a hot dog is like either you're gonna eat one hot dog or two hot dogs in a one. <laughs> <sudden> <laughs> Like, we're not like Joey Chestnut level. So it was like, I got a second hot dog and I did and I won. 
Um, <laughs> and then Trevor gave me 500 bucks in cash. And like I said, that was like the best, <laughs> the best bonus I ever got. And Dan and Ozzy and I had been like, well, what's the prize for winning the competition? Like to the Munchies people. And we were like, it should be whoever wins this. We had just gotten a new elevator installed in the office. And we were like, whoever gets this should get the elevator named after them. <laughs> and <laughs> nobody else agreed to this, but Dan and I were like, all right, well, we're going to print up a poster for whoever wins. So Dan went and like printed up a poster for me that said like the Kyle Kramer Memorial Elevator. <laughs> like an hour after this is done, the fire department shows up because the elevator had stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody was stuck in the elevator. So that was it. That was my legacy of the Kyle Kramer Memorial Elevator. On top of this, uh, apparently uh, one of the CEOs of Vice was like in talks to do some sort of special branded content series. Of course, you know this is a fucked up company because this is a phrase that exists. They were going to do a branded content series about world hunger. Um, (laughs) and he was like this is this reflects poorly on the brand that we're doing an eating competition while we're doing this so he made them take it down so there was like no proof that this had ever happened and they were it became this like company-wide scandal that there had even been a hot dog eating competition um but weren't weren't they also like launching a health vertical at the same time too (laughs) Like cramming down like processed meats. Yeah, it would have been about the same time. I mean, it might have been that was who they were going to do the branded partnership about in World Hunger with was the health vertical. Um, and uh, but I will say in the end, Joey Chestnut, like a week later, came to visit the office. So it must have been before the July 4th competition because right after he won the July 4th competition. He came to the office and he had his like championship belt, you know, like wrestler style championship belt. Uh, as you do. As you do. And I got to take a picture with Joey Chestnut and everyone was like, this guy won the office hot dog eating <laughs> competition. And Joey Chestnut was like, that's pretty cool, man. Good job. And so I, the moral of the story is I got to meet both Kobayashi and Joey Chestnut, the two greatest hot dog eaters of all time. And yeah, and I got 500 bucks. And an elevator named after you. And the worst elevator ever. <laughs> yeah, I had a really <laughs> shitty elevator. Dude, I forget how many people like constantly got stuck on that thing. Like the fire department was at the office for like every day for three years. Almost. Yeah, they like <laughs> opened a substation in the lobby. I just remember watching that on facebook live and like watching you win and being like oh my god that's my friend that's my friend like alone in my fucking garage that i was living in <laughs> where later on the t wayne release would happen in that garage. that was a great garage yeah. so see it all it all comes full circle all right well this has been nerzy the best podcast in uh north carolina New York, California, and Ontario. Brampton, baby. Don't forget Sweden. And Sweden. Yo, Kyle, we're like the number 49 music podcast in Sweden. Hell yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Is Young Lean going to come on the podcast? Uh, no, we're getting bloody. We're getting all the drain gang, dude. Fuck that. Hell yeah. Well, it's an honor to be on here. This is definitely the number one podcast that I've been on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. How many have you been on, Kyle? The, probably the the number one on the list of podcasts that I've been on. Number one is in the first. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, it's been a pleasure, guys. Uh, I don't. Do you have a sign off thing that you do? Yeah, we did it like five minutes ago. Yeah, yeah, that was it. We kind of just let this fade into darkness, and then something plays. Probably one of. Uh, or maybe we use a T Wayne song. I don't know. So I think you guys just slowly fade out. If you 
while you're talking, while I'm talking right here, that would be really good. Get wise and wise up and listen. You whack niggas wouldn't sound so fucking insufficient. I'm fishing for some bitches to give me some southern fixes. Fuck the good and when I finish, left a belly button glitzing it. This isn't just one of them rapping R&B niggas. I'm fucking with the business, some of the hardest beat rippers. Fucking with the Wayne, then you're going to get the team. And if you are wise, you listen to me. It's like Oompa Loompa, I am on my new job. Getting at your girlfriend, lifting up a two top. Call your lady super lube, giving niggas lube jobs. I'm taking pain, my money loan like a two top. I'm cold as fuck, but I am also what and who's hot. So I'm obligated to authorize what and who's not. You think I'm wack, but one day you gon' see. And if you are wise, you listen to me. Hey, straight out the backseat of the dually with the truly. I am truly unruly. Mike check one to me. It is money mouth powder. Smoking like running hot water. Better yet, like running hot lava. I am something like a ball because I cut your fucking head off. And if I'm in the building, I've been motherfucking paid off. Let me take my shades out so I can fucking see him, bitch. If you are wise, you listen to me. Yeah, shot. They got that rebel rap Like, where, where, where your shovel at? I take a trip to hell And nigga, I'ma bring the devil back And if you want some trouble I can have my people schedule that Damn, your face clear That's cause it's up in Reynolds rap This ain't no Nintendo rap Cause I don't play no games Bitch, I murder, kill, rob, steal And fuck on the same watch That mean at the same time And my need the same fine And I got that auto That's that T-Pain kind 